you, you said you come just with questions, but you've come actually with a lot of answers there. <laughs> And yeah, when, you are, when you are flying in sleepless nights, you come to certain answers, to certain <laughs> questions that even have not been raised. Yeah. But of course, answers then uh, will normally receive a, a response from other people. We will think about them. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we will get that from, uh, from the panel in a minute. Um, but I think maybe following the chain here, we should hand over to my colleague Jed Owens uh, to uh, give his views and uh, on a, a patent office take on what has been said so far and on the topic. To add on Grant, uh, I'll request uh, Gerald to be particular upon, like, let's understand that what Hans said and what was talked about earlier in regard to the standard essential patents, the amount of controversy or the, um, the impact that it has, mainly negative on the manufacturing sector per se. But let's understand the product industry is a very virgin industry where standards are still evolving. So how should we actually, uh, you being a standard uh, expert in EPO, should be handled in future such so that such controversies does not impact this emerging industry? Please. So thank you, Grant. Uh, thank you, Mr. Garg. Um, you've just challenged me with a lot of questions there. Um, and asked for solutions. So I'll see if I can provide some solutions that we have from the Patent Office side. And on a few others, I'll have to be um, a bit imaginative and perhaps pose a few questions back. But let's see where we can go with this. Um, the first thing I always have to say about patents and standards is I wonder really whether people understand the level of success that the synergy of patents and standards have had to date in the world. Um, I'll just, you know, I'm using it for my notes, so I'll have to avoid pressing the wrong buttons, but I have a mobile phone here, I have a smartphone, and there are approximately seven billion mobile phone registrations in the world today. In fact, that was already in 2014, according to the ITU. So there was one mobile phone registration for every single person in the world on average already three years ago. Um, in rural India, uh, there was a 40% penetration a couple of years ago. In urban in India, there is approximately 140% penetration because so many people have two mobile phones. They have one for their work and they have one for their private use as well. So. Um, this is a billion, billion dollar industry, and it has somehow worked. Whatever people say about mobile phones and smartphones and the number of patents in them and the patent wars that go on and the unfairness of FRAND and all the rest of it, somehow an awful lot of companies have made this work. And it's not just about making money. It's providing a service around the world where people can get internet from almost everywhere. We've seen the thousands of apps and similar things under Android and so on that have also been produced and provided us with services uh, that also support things like Uber, you know, combining GPS with... Um, high access to the internet and so on. This has been an unbelievable uh, revolution already. Um, and uh, they're affordable, frankly, to most people around the world. And so that, that's been a success. What can I say about that? Um, we've just celebrated approximately 15 years of mobile phones in this manner. The iPhone has just been celebrated um, they've only been around for 10 years. iPhones have only been around for 10 years. You know, and they've brought an X model out to celebrate that. So I think that's very important. We have a special cooperation, particularly at the EPO, with ETSI, the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. And we have an agreement with a number of standards development organizations, such as ETSI, ITU, IEEE, IEC, um, but also some smaller ones like World DMB and BSI. And we have three main purposes within that cooperation. Firstly, we gather all the standards documents. We put them in our own databases. We index them for searching in the way that our patent examiners need to have them indexed for searching. And we are able to search them then at very highest very high speed with our examiners. That's very, very important because they only have so much time to search a patent application. 
The second thing is that we agree with Etsy and ITU and so on that these standards documents really are prior art and they can be used against patent applications. Um, and the third thing is we are able then to give copies of these standards documents to the patent applicant to prove that something's not new or not inventive, etc. So that's one very important aspect of making patents and standards work. We get the standards documentation. So if you get a standards development meeting, all the relevant competitors come to a meeting like today. In fact, at the RAND discussions, you'll get two or three hundred experts putting forward their technical proposals. People compare them and they choose what they want to be in the next generation of telecommunications that goes forward. So what's very important is people have to patent the technologies that they've developed before they come to this standards discussion because we collect all the documentation from the standards discussions. And if people try and patent something in the standard after that, then we say it's not new or we say it's not inventive because you've combined Mr. A's technology with Mr. B's technology with Mrs. C's technology. That's not inventive. So we keep patent quality high to try and make sure that in Etsy, in 3GPP, in M2M, etc., you only have the patent rights which are valid there. That's also very important. There's three basic rules to making patents and standards work. Firstly, people have to declare the IPR that they have in the standards that are being developed. The second thing is we get the documentation to try and keep the patent quality as high as possible. And the third thing is people have to commit, more or less by law, to FRAND licensing. And those are the three basic elements that make the patents and standard systems work together. Now, what's the result of that? After about 15 years, that kind of period, um, Etsy has something like 15,000 patent families, over, well over 100,000 patent filings, which are registered in their standards essential database, in their declaration database for the standards essential patents. So if you go to the Etsy database, if you look up a particular parts of the standard, you should be able to find the patents there that are relevant to that part of the standard. Um, we also have a cooperation with Etsy the other way, that Etsy links into our patent databases so that when a standard essential patent is declared and it's in the Etsy database, you have a blue link, you click on the blue link, you come to the EPO's SBASnet services. Then you can see through the family how widely that patent is filed around the world. And secondly, which of those are upheld, where people still pay the fees, whether it's been granted, whether it hasn't been granted, and that gives you transparency. The most important thing about this is its cooperative development. We actually talk about standards development organizations. People like Etsy come together with Qualcomm, with Nokia, and with many other companies. Samsung is also one of the biggest patent owners, and it's increasing all the time. So you have a very large number of players here, and this is effectively cooperative development. So under 5G, the RAND discussions, they'll have two or 300 engineers there putting forward their solutions, as I said before. And effectively, the standards are simply in ICT the computer interfaces, the standard agreed computer interfaces between different components. Now, why is this important? It's so important going into the Internet of Things, into Industry 4.0, because you'll have very complex systems there with many components, and you need standardization at each element to maintain the competition between a very complex system and all the elements in it. Let me just say, I'm not sure how much time I've got, so you'll have to give me a warning. You have 2G, the first digital mobile phones, 3G, 4G, now we're coming up to 5G. The importance of that is people invest in this cooperative development. They have to have return on investment. The return on investment finances the next generation. Look at what we've got, 2G, 3G, 4G, going into 5G. Unless you have an acceptable return on investment, on the developments that people have done, you won't have the next generation. But we want the next generation. We want higher speed. We want better capacity. We want better coverage. 
And it's going to be the basis of the Internet of Things to have this 5G capacity, you know, the coverage, everything else. I'm not sure what else I should add. Um, Mr. Narayanan of Tata said that we're going from Wi-Fi to sci-fi to science fiction with the artificial intelligence and so on. Mr. Daniel Lee from Continental saying that Continental is going incontinental, intercontinental, I beg your pardon, be careful of the words there, sorry about that. Um, it seems like in future, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm not trying, I just, I have to say a few things like this. I mean, as far as I can see, cars in the future are going to be connected to everything except the driver, for instance. Um, a technology not to be scared of. A technology not to be scared of, yeah. Um, Mr. Seshana Shesh Phillips gave us some very, very concrete examples, however, about our, how artificial intelligence is going to be included and used in ultrasound, in uh, the magnetic resonance imaging, and how it will help the doctors find the most risky areas and the solutions and so on. He gave some lovely, really concrete examples that are tangible and that we can see will be coming out in the near future. Um, but I think the most important thing just to say is that automated driving is going to be a very complex, simultaneous system. Many types of vehicles, different types of roads, in different countries, with different modules, with different suppliers. A very complex system that's going to have interfaces all the way through. In other words, it's going to have standards all the way through. So as we go to artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things, we're going to have many more interfaces, we're going to have much more standards. And if you want the best technology in those standards, they're also going to be patented. So you simply have to learn to play this game. There's a number of rules involved, but you have to learn to play the patents and standards game. Now in Europe, we think we're pretty good at that, but then we've got BMW coming in, Audi coming in, medical services coming in. They've got to learn it. They've not been in the game so far. And we've got SMEs coming in. That's also very important. They've also somehow got to learn the game. And other people in other areas have got to learn to play the game. But it's a game worth playing and I can only encourage you. Thank you. So thank you, Gerald. One thing which came out very clearly is that if the standard essential patterns have to, standards and patterns have to gain certain amount of sanity, the patent offices have to play a more active or a proactive role in such matters. And here I will defer with what uh, our patent office representative said in the earlier session that the patent office has got little role to play. But there needs to be someone who actually marries it because let's understand that the, in today's day, the product industry, the manufacturer and the technology providers are three different entities and one has to actually bring them on a single platform. <coughs> now, uh, let me, because I've kept Nakul uh, away from me because he has, he's always a guy who's pressurizing me with the product policy. Uh, so I have to keep him away as far as possible. But Nakul is one, uh, is a person who actually represents or promotes the Indian product industry. And the Indian product industry and the India stack. What India stack is, well, Makul knows much more than it. But what I know is in India, something very typical is happening. We have got a unique open source based solution called the digital identity. Uh, it's, we already have nearly every citizen on board. And so we have 1.3 billion set of data sets uh, of biometric data sets. On top of it, what we have is around 1.2 billion mobile phones and nearly a billion bank accounts. And the combination of this makes a phenomenal possibility of businesses. And there is a great possibility that 
not only government is using this technology for social inclusion and to removing all sort of bottlenecks that are coming but there is a possibility of large amount of business that comes around it and indian product industry has been actually trying to promote this in a big way not only nationally but internationally but there are challenges which lie ahead with respect to that how do you actually handle this public data versus private business opportunities in the ipr space and i'll request nakul to actually talk on this issue only and not pressurize me once more for the product policy thank you thanks ajay uh, though i still have you in the hall so i always have that opportunity to continue to, to pressurize you so um, i want to talk to you on innovation and entrepreneurship and handling that to uh, patents i think what is happening in india and if you just see how innovation is changing in the last 15 years or 20 years you had us till the late 1990s building public infrastructure okay everything from roads to other facilities was built by the government of U united states post 911 what happened was uh, the us government themselves stopped investing in public infrastructure and you had private companies taking advantage of that at the same time in the last 20 30 years you've had two big bang uh, implications which have happened the internet and the smartphone which has redefined innovation entrepreneurship everything now at when this is evolving together if you were to get graham bell go back in time get him here would he recognize the phone in its in its current state i don't think so and this has typically happened because of various layers of technology one on top of the other working seamlessly seamlessly to provide new innovative products available google maps would have not been there if there was no gps gps was an incarnation of dapa right you wouldn't have uber if google maps were there not there so all of them are interrelated what we are seeing especially in india is the internet is there the smartphones are there another third level of innovation on the big bang influx point is happening and that is the emergence of platforms owned by the government when platforms like amazon are owned by private entities and therefore are more closed in their structure they do not help innovation to flourish and when you have platforms in india like my colleague uh, and my friend ajay said talked about india stack using three basic things the jandhar uh, the jam account saving accounts the aadhaar the national identity and the mobile to create various layers of technology on top of another from e sign digi lockers to payment systems which will redefine payment systems in the entire third world country all of us know on the issues of visa and mastercard which has happened in the western world you will see india breaking out of that people have talked about data data protection laws which are going to come up in, in india i can safely say that some of them will be the next generation of that happening in india and therefore it is very important to understand that when we talked about innovation and linking into patents yes innovators want to protect their ideas uh, want to monetize it at the same time it is important that things done with the right intentions are good but we also know history has taught us many lessons that things done with the right intentions usually don't end up with the best of intentions for example the nuclear bomb the point i'm trying to make to you over here is that with the rise of platforms where i talked about india stack using upi gst and data together to to give access on open source mechanisms for people innovators and entrepreneurs to build on we have government of india doing that we have a state called rajasthan which has got national highways of infrastructure built called the rajasthan stack doing the same we have the civil aviation ministry coming up with a policy on a digital traveler where you will actually be able to use your thumb and that's it as a 
uh, resident of India to make your entire journey at the airport. You, you have something called the drone policy, drone sky, the, the, the digital sky policy of the Civil Efficient Ministry coming up using platforms made by government, opening up for entrepreneurs both nationally and internationally to build on. And that's where real innovation will be driven. What we also need to realize that many of the answers, I, I guess I was not here the first half session, and I guess there's complete agreement that the patent system needs to evolve. My earlier panel talked about the patent system being more focused on hardware. It is important that keeping these new innovation mechanisms of platforms, of open structures, how patents need to play a role, or the entire IPR process needs to play a role. For software, copyrights and trade secrets, a uh, very good system to look after that. Do we need patents? Don't know. The question I'm trying to raise to all of you is that West, especially America, will not be the land of innovations coming, coming forward. Innovations will be built in, in Asia, in China, in India, using the platform system who will solve for the needs of Africa. So the first five billion, six, one, million, one billion people, we've had innovations. For the next six billion, the innovation will be done over here. And, mine, and this, please do keep this in mind. We as Indians try and not think that an actual innovation can come from India. Believe me, what's going to happen on India Stack or currently, ha currently happening on India Stack. So I don't want to take an example. How many of you have used your debit cards today on the last five days? Can you raise your hands? Okay. How many of you have used UPI? Wow. No, one, two, three. Three. Okay. <laughs> UPI is an open standard based system set up by NPCI for people to use. Okay. Now, this is a classic example. A debit card and a credit card is a classic India One problem. For example, India One is seven and a half thousand annual earning of a family of seven and a half thousand dollars and above. You have India 2 and you have India 3. India 3 is where the DBD transfers are happening. The India 2 is the segment which is totally untouched. And that is being driven by UPI transactions. So just to let you know, in the number of UPI transactions which happened last month, there were 105 million transactions which happened, more than the entire debit card space. But all of us over here, we have only made three transactions. So there's a part of India where something is happening, and we, what we call in Hindi, Bharat, or rural India, that's what is driving this engine of innovation. That will drive innovation not only in the rural India, but Africa and a lot of CIS countries, Middle East as well. So the patent laws or patent uh, focus needs to be seen as to how innovators are protected, yes, but at the same, same time, uh, innovate, just for the name of innovation, you have large corporations coming in and stifling entrepreneurial freedom completely. That needs to be kept in mind. If you allow software patenting, which currently in Government of India does not, I mean, an industry of software products, what Mr. Ajay Garg is working on, will be redundant. We won't have 100,000 companies on the product side if that were to happen. So you need to look at this very differently. Many things, the paradigm of the past is there to learn from. But please, it's changed completely. Payment systems is being defined. Worldwide payment systems is being defined by UPI in India. The Sri uh, Krishna committee has talked about data and has taken it one step forward. How can we use data for data empowerment? And I feel in the next three to five months, how privacy laws get shaped in India will define how privacy laws happen throughout the world, right? And therefore, we need to look at solutions which are more forward-looking and therefore in touch with the realities of the new world, which later can be printed on to, to the rest of the world. The question of, and since we, uh, all of us have already said that Payments, uh, patents need to be fair, intention, responsive. That, when multinationals come into the country, we, even with the best of intentions, few 
go wrong. And therefore you have, uh, Ajay, I was talking to earlier, probably 10% of companies which have filed patents as an attack mechanism rather than a defensive mechanism contribute towards 90% of the litigation which happen on patents, which a small SME, an entrepreneur cannot pay for. Those are the aspects which we need to look at and think about as well. But mark my words, the level of innovation on payments and privacy, India will be leading using various platforms. Ministries are leading it through India Stack, through the digital sky policies. That's all I got to say. Thanks. Well, that was a very, uh, I'll say, uh, interesting intervention and uh, thought-provoking uh, ideas uh, for our last from our last speaker, and um, I would ask you also to to think about those questions because they are certainly the ones which uh, we all will be confronted with without any doubt whatsoever in the next five to ten years, probably sooner than we think. And we have to find answers if we are to, to make our for, way forward for society. So these are real, really live questions and lie within our responsibility. We have had some, uh, in fact, uh, we've, we've had all together some very thought-provoking interventions, but we have one more yet to come. And I would now like to hand over to Mr. Paul Jensen from the uh, European Business and Technology Center and a member of the advisory board at Think Link Supply Chain Services. No, it's gone. Uh, thank you, Grant. Now, if Professor Goddard says he has a lot of questions, more than answers, I would like him to have a look inside my head right now. Because <laughs> um, I can, with quite uh, great confidence, say after having uh, listened to all these panels and, and, and listened to participants' questions, that I am uh, probably one of the least uh, technically qualified uh, speakers and participants here today. Nonetheless, uh, we're involved, as EBDC, in, uh, in this, uh, this whole role. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, I could for sure use some artificial intelligence about right now. Um, <laughs> patent and non-patent, I don't care. I'll take any help. <laughs> now, EBDC's role, European Business Technology Center, was, was constituted to support uh, collaboration between Europe and India, uh, mainly in, in clean technologies, but also uh, ICT, and ICT is, is, is a key component of many uh, clean technologies. And uh, you can imagine the, the, the two governments working together, they are looking at, at, at hiking trade, ensuring that collaborations actually happen, that collaborations are successful, and that trade in, increases. And when you talk technology, when you talk cross-border technology collaborations, um, you can't avoid talking about, about IP. Now this session is also about innovation and entrepreneurs and so forth. And we took a big, deep look at, at what could we do in India, what can we learn from what Europe has done, what is an innovation ecosystem, and we've looked at clusters and been uh, creating awareness in India about clusters being, trying to help in supporting set up uh, clusters, being part of uh, uh, councils that, uh, that uh, help in, in, in policy interventions towards uh, cluster building. Um, we are part of uh, creating awareness about IP and, um, and, and what are the crucial elements there. Uh, and when you talk about cross-border technology collaboration, you also talk about uh, technology localization, technology adaptation, technology commercialization. And again, IP pops up on, on the screen all the time. So we couldn't, say, avoid uh, talking about IP in, in, in this whole scenario and, and needed to see how do we, how do we, how do we fit in, in this. And with the main beneficiaries of whatever EBDC does being SMEs and being entrepreneurs, uh, because, as politicians also like to, to say on both sides of, of, uh, of the line between India and EU, uh, is that 99% uh, of our economy are SMEs. Uh, so we have to focus on that. Now, um, dealing with SMEs makes everything a lot more fragmented than dealing with MNCs. So it's, it's, it's a whole different ballgame. It's a different uh, thinking, different uh, approach uh, that you have to take. And connecting... SMEs with uh, uh, you know, a European SME with an Indian SME, connecting an Indian entrepreneur with an, a European entrepreneur, and dealing with a set of problems that they have um, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a different ball game, and, and trying to figure out uh, uh, what support they, they need. And I can tell you, at, at the moment, the 
best support anyone can give them right now is creating awareness on both sides. What is the importance of, of IP? Uh, how does it help support you if you have an invention? If you enter into a collaboration, how do you, how do you split the IP? How do you create an IP strategy that makes sense for both parties? Um, and, and that um, uh, is, 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 a, is, is a lot of work. And for many SMEs, for the smaller SMEs, it's also a hurdle. So any, any support they can, they can get uh, is, is, uh, is, is very welcome. Now, part of the topic of this session is also uh, what is the importance of a robust e-system, whether this is the, 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 the whole, whole conference. And I can tell you, too, for European SMEs, they're very savvy in using the patent information system. They're very savvy in, in trying to search uh, what is already there, uh, how can I connect with somebody uh, um, uh, who might be associated to me, who's related to me, um, uh, is there already a patent in this space? Um, and I have been in India now for, for almost uh, completing 13 years, and I have seen the difference in in what has happened in the intellectual property office and what has happened in the patent ecosystem in India for the past 10 years. And it's remarkable. And I agree with someone uh, early on an earlier panel that said that India has done in a decade what others have uh, spent uh, many decades on. Yeah? And, but that's not the only space, by the way, that India is skipping generations. India is leapfrogging uh, like anything in the telecom space, in the IT space, everywhere. And uh, so if anybody has the potential to do it, it's, it's for sure, it's for sure uh, India. Now, um, it's becoming easier and easier for, for instance, a European SME to see what is already available uh, in, in India before I take, as an SME, uh, the big decision uh, to go abroad to invest money and also being told that you have to take a long-term view. You have to uh, not try and think only of India as a market and come there and sell products and if it doesn't work in a year, I'm gone. Think long-term, think five years, think seven years, even think ten years and think co-creation, I think this was also mentioned briefly on this panel, uh, really think uh, how can I, uh, with what I have, partner with someone in India, how can I co-create, how can I with him, with that partner, develop something that is even more interesting for the Indian market, but more importantly, also potentially very interesting for, for a global market. And I think that's, uh, if, if we as Europeans come onto that boat, if we start thinking with that approach, uh, I think the, the, we have a much uh, bigger canvas that we, can, that, we can, uh, that we can paint on for sure. And um, the uh, Europeans put a lot of faith in, in, in the patent system and this is also what they, they are expecting when they, when they, when they come, come elsewhere. And I, I can also say that a lot of the companies that we have dealt with at EBDC, they have been to other markets before. Um, um, a lot of them have been to China and have had not so positive experiences on EP and um, 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 enforcement of IP rights and so forth. Having said that, in the ICT space, we also hear from many companies that um, it's so dynamic, development is so fast, so the best patent is to be the fastest. Yeah? It's not necessarily to, uh, to, to go through an 18-month process to, to, to patent, or the patent system is, is developed to accommodate that you can uh, file patents or some other uh, IP-related uh, applications to ensure that you have a, have a right on, on that invention faster than, than, uh, than it is today. Um, so I think uh, um, that's, that's uh, I, I can only give you some examples of what we, what we, what we, what we feel on, on the ground. I can't give you answers to, 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 how, to how to deal with it, how to, how to manage it, but these are, these are voices from, uh, from, from the ground, from collaborations, active collaborations, active inventors, SMEs, entrepreneurs who have uh, technologies, and it's exactly EBDC's role um, to pick up on that and feed it into uh, the policy making dialogue uh, to feed it into uh, any stakeholder in the whole IP ecosystem that uh, who are interested in making uh, creating a, a, a robust ecosystem within IP to ensure that inventions will continue that we will have next generation of, of, of many technologies um, and that's exactly exactly uh, um, uh, our world, and that's also why why we're here. That's uh, to to um, enhance this dialogue and and and, and um, give give uh, give uh, the SMEs and the entrepreneurs and, and and those sort of inventors a lot of uh, a lot of say. So um, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Dr. Gar. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. So now we have heard all of our panel, and we have a lot of food for thought. Um, but I'd like to start the ball rolling. Uh, we have 
have heard that maybe the patent system is appropriate for uh, patenting software. But if we roll back from there, the question is, is software really suited for the patent system? But let's roll back from there. What is, what is software? What are we really talking about here? And around this topic, we've heard a lot about data. So I would just like to come to the data aspect because this seems to me to be very central to a lot of this discussion as to whether in the first place that is at all appropriate for any intellectual property protection. And we heard from Professor Heinz Goddard that perhaps this should be treated as a bioresource. But I would ask the panel uh, the question whether data per se, it's, it's property, someone's property, is it intellectual property? Does it have anything to do with our question here today? And if not, where does that really leave us for the rest of the discussion? So perhaps I could, Nakul Saxena, Mr. Nakul, come to you to uh, attempt to answer that question. Thank sure. You. Uh, in terms of data, who owns data? And how iSpirit's view is modeled around that is that we believe that we need to invert the pyramid there completely. The data at the end of the day belongs to an individual, the customer. And without the consent of that individual or the customer, the data should not be shared with any party concerned. And if it is shared, it is shared for a certain time period, for a specific purpose, and not the complete code. And that is what uh, we have, what we call DEPA, or data to empower people. And that's, we, that's where we see the role of data moving on different because I know in Europe, for example, the data generated on your mobile phone, who owns that data? And there have been quite a few law cases on that as well, where there is the metadata op owned <coughs> by the telecom companies or the individual. So that's a tough one, but in, in India, but how we are seeing this is that the, all data of that individual will belong to that individual. And going by some of the comments by the Sri Krishna committee, I think it's heading in that direction. Thank you. Would, would other pan, panel members like to comment on that, Mr. Malhotra? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I, I think I follow the, uh, the lead from him saying that data is going to be very, very crucial and it's going to be e individualistic need. However, there's, there's another conundrum that comes into being and, and that's in today's world again, I being an AI evangelist myself, I'm going to be a little technical over here. Unless I get data, I cannot make AI models. And that's very crucial for me. Now in that sense, when I create a model of an AI machine, which actually predicts something out of it, maybe not you know, putting that data into practice, into a real practical world, where does the invention really lie? Was it me creating those models? Was it me creating that using that data so that this model could fit into any other data that come into being and, and stuff like that. So there, that's, that's also another conundrum. Although we do not look at data perspective saying that I'm going to siphon off an individual's data, but I'm going to still utilize that data to build a little bit of a, a, a model, right? And, that, and that's where the whole change comes in. And there are some open source uh, facilities available for us to get data. There are some closed sources where we anonymize those data. But um, I'm not clear, there's no real solution to it. But that opens up a lot of other questions for us to patent and, and to figure out as to what do we do from an IPR perspective on those apps. Yes. Because this is a question which drives us also a lot is, of course, we know data is important, and we know that um, that there are platforms, that there, there are people who are developing the AI, AI, and then who are people make using the AI and data to provide services. But at the end of the day, I think current the current system just benefits the ones who develop the platform. To currently, you can you can um, you can uh, protect by a patent the AI itself. But for example, you can't protect, in case of Uber, for example, they can't protect their business model per se. They can maybe uh, protect some parts of their, um, of their algorithm in the background, et cetera. But the, the, the business model per se itself is, is 
I, I guess it's not protected. And, but nevertheless, is, is the question is, is that business model not invent, innovative? I would not say so. I would say the business model is very innovative, but the patent system itself does not, honestly, in my opinion, not give enough um, room to, to protect the, the core of their, of their business um, and service itself. This, and that's why I guess a lot of service providers like Uber or like Google, they are going into collecting more the data and wh whatever the legislation is, they, they are owning it. Um, we, we may dispute this somehow, but the, the, the data is on their servers and what they're doing is, they're, what they're focusing is to, um, to use the data to pro provide and improve their, their, their services. But I guess because of that, they know, okay, we can use the data we already have, we don't and we have an advantage on the market days, they're not so focused on protecting it from a, point, um, from a system point of view. And so you, you said in, in your discussion that, yeah, there are platforms and using the platforms on the platforms making ideas will help to, make, uh, uh, to create new inventions. But I, honestly speaking, I'm doubt on it. I guess the main benefits is on the platform owner. They have the patents on the platform, on the platform system. But I guess the ones who makes the application on the platform, who generates, a, let's say, the second level invention, they have difficulties to, to protect this because either it's not inventive because the, the elements of the applications are already like part of prior art and most of the patent offices say, okay, it, it, it has been obvious to, to combine this. So I, I really would like to challenge that somehow the, is, our, is our patent system open enough to, to provide protection for those ones who make the second level um, inventions and services? So that's a good question actually. So let me try and put this further. The platforms which are being generated in India are used for public good, okay, and are not, op are not owned by corporations themselves, right? So the question of profit motive does not come in over there, number one. Number two, uh, you took examples of Uber, Google owning data <coughs> and using that data. The, the tricky part of the second level of users is that do we use that data with cons consumer consent? Do we know, all of us today use smartphones. Do we know what kind of permissions have we given for enabling us to use this uh, data? Some of it, if amplified, will literally scare all of us over here and really maybe put, take us to a non-smartphone or other mechanisms as well. Because the data which is being used by second entities, sure they want to use data and build AI platforms around it, sure go ahead. But as long as the data consent is with you and you allow a customer or an individual to back off and say no, I don't want to share my data or I want to share my data, I think that needs to be inbuilt, number one. Number two is the fact that if you don't allow an opportunity for the individual to say no, I don't want to be used, but I still want to do use a data platform, that will typically lead to digital apartheid. Because if I'm on Facebook today and I don't agree to share my data, I'm stuck because all my friends are on Facebook. So there has to be an evol evolution of models, both by entrepreneurs and everywhere, everywhere concerned where that data is used by consent and if the individual does not give that data, it should stop there. And yet, he should have a mechanism available for him to partake in the overall ecosystem as well. I, I just want to enter, since it's a, it's, a, it's a topic of great interest and you've actually hit upon a chord that I also figured out and that's my conundrum as well. I think it's not about, um, I think Daniel, right, it's, if, if I'm pronouncing your name right. So I think, uh, I think Daniel's hit upon the point which is not about just the consensual usage of data. I think, I think we all agree that data cannot be used or misused from a perspective of a platform. I think what he's raised as, as a point is what does the patent system consider? as what do you want to create as an intellectual property right now if you look at traditionally from 1950s to 1960s algorithms of ai have not changed at all they're the same old 40 year old algorithms that have been utilized now if i utilize those algorithms and i make something completely new which has a new practical application should i be considered as a patent holder should i be considered that this was something unique that i created even though it was a common good or for commercial usage number one number two um, 
do we now want to rethink the philosophy of patenting of not doing anything with the neural networks are we are we done with them because all of them would eventually utilize neural networks to do that or so should we start doing patenting going a little technical about patenting what's something which is beyond neural networks right so I, I don't think it's about usage of platforms i don't think it's about usage of non-consensual data i think it's more about how do we evolve the patent system which says like in my lab i have created a machine that actually creates code now who's the patent holder me or the machine who decides it and I don't think my IPR cell can actually decide because there's no code that is being generated, right? I have actually given some directions to the machine. I have just removed the synaptic weights and, and trained it in a way that it creates more code. That code's not visible. Now, I've created a platform. Another developer can actually come in and use this platform to create another code. So is this patentable? Does it come under the IPR philosophy? So these are questions, I think, and that's an important point that he's raised over there. Uh, before the the point that you raised actually this uh, it's well understood that the patent systems needs to rethink upon but one thing that you very rightly said that more than the patent system what has challenged the present technology is the privacy laws whether it has to be from the consent as Nakul said or whether the enormity of the data and it being apl applied to public good or something or so for some uh, proprietary use that is the next generation of the privacy laws that needs to evolve because let's understand that if in certain part of this country uh, there are diseases that needs to be handled and data analytics can play a long, uh, a very crucial role in that healthcare systems. And using that data analytics through an enormous data can be very useful for addressing many of the social problems. Uh, you, Haynes. Yeah, I would like to say the following. I mean, I'm not talking when I say data uh, uh, in the following, I would not like to talk about the individual data of a certain individual which makes it possible to develop a cancer fighting drug or something like this. That's a different question. Also, that person is possibly a co-inventor because she or he makes available an essential element of this whole treatment uh, method or whatever there is. No, I mean about data collection. We have not without reason in at least European laws, at least in German law, we have the provision that under trade secret considerations, collections of data, configurations of data are protectable. They are considered as intellectual property, though at the moment not yet sufficiently considered under patent law. And I think whenever these collected data, which by the way, for many purposes uh, to create or use uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence uh, whatsoever, uh, you can anonymize many things. You, don't, you need the mass of data, the configuration. That the creators of such collections of data are, if you put that data into use in a certain patent claim, intelligently, sufficiently intelligent, intelligently drafted, these the, co the, the creator of that is a co-inventor. By the way, one has also has to consider whether or not the collectors, I heard from by, 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 by one of my, my co-panelists co here today, um, I heard that, that the, in, the people who have all these patents, which have then in Etsy or wheresoever, to be put together to make a standard, I hope intelligently, they don't randomly take all patents. They choose certain technology features which then are protected by certain patents. The creator of that standard, from my viewpoint, I have never seen anything written about this, are from my viewpoint also creating an invention that might even be a patentable invention. How to combine 608 different patents in order to have a specifically good standard. And I do not understand why nobody 
accepts, or at least many of my friends don't accept the idea that standard essential patents, if really used in such a standard, they need, in terms of determining royalty rates, a premium on that. Also, the creation of the standard is already something which is in addition to the mere use of standard essential patents. Coming back, that is also a kind of data collection, and I think that collected data, all people who have uh, one short or right finger or whatever, uh, to use that for a certain uh, machine which can uh, better handle uh, traffic because it's easier for these people to, to use a direction finder or something like this. This is all together then a co-inventorship. I cannot help. Very clear, very provocative. No answers. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of questions and um, uh, that's good. Right. Further questions from the floor? to the panel. Do we have any? Yes, we do. One here. Hi, my name is Ajay. Uh, I'm the founder of Nucos Technologies, um, based in the Maker Village. So we develop smart excels. So we have heard about that Tata has invented a Sonata watch, which can send a SOS message to the uh, Predefined number for women's safety, and Mahindra is also testing it into his employee as a beta testing. So, uh, and we are also working has a small part of it into the garment. So, uh, from the three, who will is there any IP related to it, or if there any, who will get it? And second question, uh, why the uh, Tata failed in uh, selling these watching watches? So I can only answer one part of the question because I'm not Tata's, I'm Mahindra's. So, no, but <laughs> so similar, similar. Thing. From, from your perspective, <laughs> yeah, from my perspective, I think I'm, I'm going to go back to Heinz's uh, approach. Um, if we have utilized a specific bit of technology, we've utilized a specific bit of data and created an outcome value, yeah. we're all co-innovators. Whether it's Mahindra, whether it's yeah. you, whether it's Tata's, it's all called as a co-innovation circle. This is easier, this is easily demarcated at this point in time. What's not easily demarcated is if I take one of your ideas within the Mahindra community or anything and I actually develop something as a completely new practical application, mm -hmm. will that be considered as an offshoot or will you be still considered a co-inventor for me? Right? That's the bigger challenge. Uh, the challenge over here is clearly demarcated. You came to me, you said, I've got an idea. Okay, I've got some data, I've got some idea. Let's create an IoT platform. Let's create some data analytics behind the scenes. All good, job well done, we're all co-innovators. Now, looking at your perspective, I've got a new idea. And that new idea, I've completely developed it into a completely new thing. Now, on your Sonata watch, I'm going to drive the tractor. Now, is that my patent? That's the bigger question over here, right? And that's where laws have to completely transform. So if, you, if we became the proprietary of a certain bit of a concept with a certain bit of software and a certain bit of hardware, it should continuously follow through for any other specific piece or mode of uh, communication. That's number one. Number two is, I don't know whether Tata fizzled out or not fizzled out, that's not for me to tell. But I think we are utilizing that technology in a lot of different places. We are also utilizing it for farm powered tractors. Mm -hmm. You're going to have uh, AI powered tractors as well. They do, do, do drive themselves. We have actually tested it. We even testing into uh, certain cars, uh, which are AI powered and semi autonomous, depending on the Indian road conditions. Uh, in fact, we have actually tried it in Mercedes bus as well. So there are different places in which these IOTs could be tried. Right? I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, but I would like to add even something. If all these components which you are putting together are patented in themselves and you find now this new application which you can use for many things, you again make a dependent invention and fortunately the laws of certain countries like India, for example, have this deblocking possibility, namely that if you patent this incremental innovation, then you have the right to use it. That means the original, the other patents which you are using must give you a license to do so. It comes at a price in Germany, for example, under cross-license price. And I think these are mechanisms which can make sure that you make out of incremental innovations, you make a new thing which you then can use with the permittance which must be given, however, of the original patent owners. And for that, I understand, for example, not, and I refer also to something what Paul said before, SMEs to consider, they make many, many incremental inventions. In my country, in your country, these are the maybe 
maybe major innovators even. All these incremental inventions. Why a country like India, unfortunately, I must say in certain technical fields, makes it so difficult to patent incremental inventions, because only if you have that, you can make use of this provision of your patent law to have a right for a cross to, to be entitled in a cross license, etc. I'm thinking of Article 3D for pharmaceuticals, prohibition of second medical use. These are the fields where in these uh, technical uh, applications, uh, patents are necessary to have a currency, as Vice President Lutz said, for getting licenses under certain things. And for computer-related inventions, it's the same. I hope, sincere hope, that the new guidelines here and the practice, particularly how courts implement them, that they will lead to the possibility to patent much, much more computer-related inventions, which are the currency small and medium-sized enterprises need to play with the big ones in Redmond or elsewhere in this world. That is necessary in all technologies. The, the weapon of the little man, of the little entity, is to come to the same eye height, so to say, on the same level as the big players, are the patents. And therefore, we must incremental inventions who are worth to be patented, patentable. And it is not so good to prevent that. I think this, if I, if I could just add something there as well, I think this raises a number of, for patent offices, a number of cross, cross influences yeah. and issues. We, we discussed Heinz recently. Um, for instance, um, well, a company showed us recently um, a project, uh, an artificial intelligence uh, project in uh, retinal imaging to detect uh, macular degeneration. Um, the learning set was put through, it learned how to identify it with a high degree of accuracy, and then you start asking the system other questions, uh, having given it, given it the megadata, um, which of these retinal images is male and which female? And uh, the, it was also able to answer that. Not that an ophthalmologist could identify that at all, and nobody knows how it's answering that. So you, you have a sort of second artificial intelligence use, if you like. Um, so we maybe have to borrow from other areas. We, we also have, in, in other events uh, discussed and other discussions, um, the possible increased use of examples borrowing from the, the chemistry and the, the ph ph uh, pharmaceutical area in patenting. Um, that perhaps in this area now examples become much more important yeah, right. as evidence positive that something, positive examples, that uh, something is being achieved. So I think patent offices have to, all of that is within our scope and our remit. We could do that. Um, we have to have the idea to do it in the first place and then um, see how that actually goes through then the second instances and is confirmed or otherwise. So um, we have another question, I think, and possibly it's the last one of the, se the session. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, my, my question is for Nakul. Uh, so iSpirit is the leading voice in India for uh, product enhancements, and so the industry gets created for products, and th this is the panel we have. So are you really advocating patents, or are you saying we shouldn't have patents in India? <laughs> Interesting. So we firmly believe there should be no patenting on software. Okay. And, and then how? Number one. Number one. Number two, to look after the interests of people who are producing it. So let me tell you the complete story to this. In my opinion, trademarks. Let, let him ask, uh, ask the second question. Ah, okay. Ask your question and answer, try and answer everything. So, and, and my second question was then, uh, then, how do you expect the SMEs like us to actually make money or raise money if we don't have the patents? Good question. Well, I can push them if you want. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'll uh, try and answer this. In my view, software patents or software patents really don't help innovation. And that's a misnomer that software patents lead to innovation. I'm not talking about patents in general, I'm only talking specifically software patents only, <laughs> number one. Number two is the other aspect that, uh, please understand, if you are fighting in America, because they have a broken patent system, yes, please go ahead and get your software patents to survive, right? Because that's a broken system by itself. And all the new innovative thinkers in US, Elon and everybody do not subscribe to the concept of software patenting. Two is if in India, and I'd like to throw this question back to you, uh, and maybe a question to Heinz as well and look for his direction <laughs> as to that if you're looking for SMEs to come, come and innovate, Copyrights and trade secrets, part of the IPR regime, are enough to, 
to look after software paper, uh, to look after the ideas or the innovator. Second aspect is that how do you stop? You are based in India. Yeah, we are based in India. Yes. Are you selling in India? We will be selling global. Yeah. Yeah. So globally, I agree. You need to have a patents because it's because of broken systems, you have to compete with them. But in a system where in India, if you were competing in India, and you had companies who can put in billion and gazillion dollars or m merely replicate their patents or get in the patent regimes from wherever they filed, filed in India, how does an Indi Indian entrepreneur survive? By just one single innovation, so let's say I want to compete with Reliance so or Infosys. <laughs> yeah, this is endless, but I think this is a big, um, yeah, it is sometimes understood like this, I would say. I would not say it is a misunderstanding. Copyright does not give you, as an innovator, the same reason to invest into innovation because you have not objectively the possibility to exclude others from what you have invented. Copyright protects against copying, but not against independent inventions by others. So in order to solicit money into innovation, you need a stronger fence around your innovation, the software related to techn technical problems and their solution. Otherwise, we will not have these innovations. So copyright is, by the way, only with one other remark, if we think of protection of individuals and whatsoever under German law, the poor software inventor who is employed somewhere where the employer in its, um, uh, the employee who makes an invention and the employer in its wisdom decides not to patent but rely on soft or copyright protection as such, finished. Property of the employer, no remuneration, nothing. Should we leave it to the decision of an employer whether the employee should get a fair share of the commercial benefit? But this is a specific German problem. I don't wish to refer to that. But quite in general, patenting gives you the possibility to share your innovations with others because you have an objective exclusion right and therefore you can renounce that right under certain fair conditions where others have to pay for it. Copyright? No. That is copying against, that is protection against copying, everybody else can say, oh, I turn around, I do this myself, I go to Fiji, I don't read newspapers anymore, I make the same software. No, prob no, no possibility to protect.